All right, we're going to reconvene our second panel. It's an equally timely topic. Uh, I'm sure all of you are following in the news uh, the insistent incarnations in travel ban 1 and 2 and 3.0. Uh, as I'm sure our panel will tell us, uh, that's only the tip of the horror of the current immigration uh, iceberg that we're uh, facing, and there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so this panel will be uh, moderated by my colleague, uh, Professor Rachel uh, Rosenblum, who uh, teaches our immigration law uh, classes, uh, and is about to launch uh, a new venture uh, here at the law school. <coughs> Uh, Justice Clinic, and maybe she'll tell you a little bit uh, about that. Uh, Professor Rosenblum is a graduate of Columbia University. She has a master's from Berkeley and a law degree from uh, uh, NYU. Uh, she clerked for uh, Judge Lasker on the uh, District Court uh, in New York, Southern Southern District of New York. Uh, she's a prolific uh, scholar of uh, immigration law. I can tell you I've read many of her articles, and uh, she's a rare person who's both a uh, a brilliant scholar uh, and a great uh, lawyer. Uh, we're proud to have her on the faculty. This uh, fall, she is uh, teaching, of course, at uh, Yale Law School as a, a visiting professor. And just last week, uh, she served as the moderator uh, on the immigration law panel uh, at the Clinton uh, Global Initiative University with uh, Madeline Albright. So it's an honor to have her here on the faculty, and I'm proud to introduce her. Uh, and welcome everybody, good morning. Um, uh, it's fun to be here at, at uh, the Alumni Weekend. I know some of you already, but I'm looking forward to meeting others of you who I don't know yet. Uh, I joined the faculty here in 2009, and uh, before that I was involved for a number of years in immigrant rights work of one sort or another, and one of the really fun things in my first few years here uh, was realizing over and over that some of these people who I crossed paths with, whose work I found so inspiring, and you know, I started to realize, I'm like, oh, oh, right, that person's a Northeastern graduate. Oh, oh, that person is too. And you know, it's sort of like now that I had my Northeastern hat on, I was looking at the world through uh, that lens, and, um, and it just, you know, it was almost comical. It started to feel at a certain point like everybody is <laughs> doing the good work in this field is from Northeastern. Uh, and, uh, and actually, now that I've been here for a few years, it's even more fun, because I get to look out at who's doing great work and think not only that person's a Northeastern graduate, but that person's my former student. Uh, <laughs> looking at you, Anisha, and many others. And, um, and as any of you who've taught in any capacity know, it, it, uh, that's one of, one of the finer things in life, is, is that realization. Uh, so this was a very easy panel to put together. Uh, the only hard thing about it was narrowing it down to five people because we really have uh, dozens uh, of graduates who are leaders uh, in this field. Uh, so uh, on to the topic at hand. I don't have to tell you we are living through very difficult times. Uh, I'd say there's been no time in, in you know in my lifetime where we've had more of a need for for really creative powerful organizing and for really creative powerful legal advocacy to support that organizing uh, and on, on many many fronts uh, particularly uh, when it comes to immigrants uh, the attacks I, I don't actually uh, I, I try to stay away from the word unprecedented because I know a little too much about the history of immigration <laughs> enforcement in this country, but certainly uh, extreme attacks on immigrants, uh, and you'd have to go back many years, I think, to find uh, attacks of this magnitude from the Muslim ban to stepped up interior enforcement to cuts in uh, the refugee, uh, the overseas refugee program to the ending of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, in, many, in many, many respects. Um, but our topic today is not so much uh, this crisis. Our topic is uh, the resistance to it. And resistance is something that Northeastern graduates are very good at. Uh, it's also something that Northeastern students 
and faculty and administrators care very deeply about. So before I turn this over to our amazing panelists, uh, I just want to say a quick word about that, about what's been going on on campus. Uh, our students were eager to dive in to the fray right after the election, right after the inauguration, and they have been active in many ways. They've been doing Know Your Rights trainings in the community. They've been uh, going to Logan Airport to protest and to, to give out information at the lawyer table there. Uh, they've been putting in hours at a lot of local uh, immigrant rights organizations. And I, I just want to say this has really been a collective effort. There's been a lot of faculty who, who don't teach immigration, uh, people like Wally Hallahan and, and Mary Landrigan who just kind of stepped up um, to take leadership on this and our students were right there um, uh, looking for kind of ways to plug in. Uh, and our administration, as you might know, the, the university as a whole uh, submitted an amicus brief in um, the, one of the legal challenges to the Muslim ban. Uh, and then as uh, the dean alluded to, uh, on November 27th, we will be opening the doors of the new Northeastern Immigrant Justice Clinic. say those words, but it's actually happening. Uh, and uh, um, it's really exciting. And I, I don't have to tell you, you, you know better than I do, some of you, this has been a long time coming. <laughs> I hear, I, I often hear from, from people who graduated in the 90s that they were pushing for this clinic. And you know, it just goes to show, I mean, you, you gotta get in it for the long haul, because sometimes <laughs> it takes a while, but it happens, right? So, um, and uh, we will be, uh, we'll have our first uh, group of students in the winter quarter. We're really, really excited about it. I'll be co-directing it with my colleague, Hamath Kundavaram, who I think unfortunately couldn't be here today. He's great. If you haven't met him yet, hopefully you'll meet him soon. And um, we will be, yeah, stay tuned. You'll, we'll be giving you updates when we're up and running, but um, we're just really excited right now to be about to be opening the, the doors. So, uh, so today, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm, we're gonna go in the order you know, people are sitting. I'm just gonna briefly introduce everybody right now and, um, and throw out a few questions to them. We're gonna hear from everybody. We're gonna have plenty of time for discussion. We really want to include everyone here um, in this. Uh, <coughs> we want to both quest questions for the panelists, but also hear what, you, what you've been up to as well. Um, so, uh, we have here, uh, so starting right here, we have um, Stephen Bloom, who's the director, uh, who's the class of 1992, uh, director of government relations at the American Council on Education. Uh, next time we have Anisha Gandhi, who's a, a supervising attorney at the LGBT Immigrant Rights Initiative of the National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago. Uh, and then we have Shamtoli Huck, uh, 1990s, class of 1997, Anisha's class of 2012. So Shamtoli's class of 97, she is uh, attorney and editor at uh, a very, very interesting um, a website called Law at the Margins. Um, and I should say this actually, um, well, two things I actually want to say here. One is we have a list of resources. Um, it's obviously kind of a, just a partial list. There's many things out there, but it's some really good resources. You can pick up, uh, if you're interested in exploring these topics more, you can pick that up right there on that table. Um, and uh, and I also, I, I'll just say here, since she's sitting right there, when I said, you know, that I got to Northeastern and I started to realize more and more that all these people I admi admired uh, were Northeastern graduates. So when I was a law student in New York in the late 90s, there was this young attorney who was right out of school who was doing all this amazing work with South Asian taxi drivers in New York. And I was in the immigrant rights clinic at NYU, and we all basically wanted to be Shamtoli. <laughs> <laughs> she's one of, one of the many people who, when I got to Northeastern, I was oh, right, she's one of ours. Um, so, uh, and then uh, next to her, we have the Honorable Eliza Klein, class of 1982, who uh, was uh, for many years an immigration judge uh, and has uh, now gone back to private practice. And uh, finally, we have Heather Yance. Oh, and uh, Eliza Class of yeah, 1982. So we have Heather Yance, Class of 2007, uh, who is an attorney at Demacy and Church, uh, a local uh, immigration firm here in Massachusetts, uh, here in Boston, in Cambridge, that um, was all over the, the if those of you who live here, luckily, might have seen they were all over the globe. Um, 
uh, back when the travel ban, um, when, when, the, when the, Muslim, the first Muslim ban first went into effect and they were running into court at midnight to challenge it. So um, our, for all of our panelists here, we have, we've asked them to consider three questions. Um, the first is how have you been responding to the current crisis? Uh, the second is what lessons have you learned either from responding to this crisis or, or prior crises? Um, and what are your thoughts on the way forward? So, uh, Stephen, let's, let's start with you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I want to answer the questions directly. I, you know, uh, I'll sort of talk uh, kind of mostly on the policy side because that's what I do in Washington. Uh, I'm, as a professor, I'm a director of government relations for the American Council on Education. ACE is not a hardware store. It's the, it's the uh, convening umbrella organization for higher education in the United States. We represent everybody from community colleges to the major research universities, public and private, traditional higher education I'm talking about, not the for-profit. Uh, and everyone in between, Northeastern is an example of the folks we represent. Uh, I'm on the, the, uh, the lobbying uh, public policy team there. Um, uh, I can assure you that uh, it doesn't look any better there than it does here. Um, uh, my portfolio, to give you just uh, a sense, immigration is part of a larger portfolio I have that my boss likes to refer to lovingly as the portfolio of death. Uh, I have tax, health care, reform, immigration, labor, and employment. So in the immigration space, uh, not surprisingly, after the election, uh, uh, we were deeply worried about DACA. DACA is not a law, not a, not a regulation. It was simply a policy that the Obama administration rolled out in June of 2012, exercising their prosecutorial discretion. Uh, it provided uh, the recipients, who, those folks who were eligible, you know, young people, young people who were brought here as children, really, uh, by their parents, uh, mostly. Um, certain uh, protected status from being deported uh, during a two-year period when they had the, 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 the DACA status. It also gave them, most importantly, for many of them, uh, a work authorization. Um, but, as I said, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't regulation, it wasn't a law, it was simply uh, a policy. Not even <coughs> implemented by the president, but, but by DHS secretary Dan Napolitano. So, uh, how many people ended up getting DACA? About 800,000, about 300 or 350,000 in higher education. So, you can imagine for, for us, it was a very important uh, uh, policy. And we were, we were uh, deeply worried about it. Spent uh, really began working on DACA um, right after the election. I mean, we've been working on the Dream Act, uh, piece of legislation that DACA uh, really was modeled after. That was first introduced uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, we were one of the uh, original uh, endorsing organizations. Uh, my boss was on the the press uh, relief, the press conference with Senator Durbin, who was then the lead sponsor of the, the Dream Act back in 2000 or 2001. In any event, uh, well, we were doing a lot of advocacy over the course of the year to try and figure out what was going to happen with, with uh, DACA. The president uh, was giving sort of, you know, some positive signs, but there was inconsistent signals coming out of both DHS as well as the, the White House and certainly the Hill. Um, and it was very uncertain. And uh, as you know, uh, September 5th, the president uh, announced that he was going to be ending the policy or phasing it out. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, there wasn't really much, uh, although I know there's some litigation that we've been you know, watching. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Trump bans and where higher ed uh, sort of engaged in the litigation process at a very high level, certainly from ACE's perspective. There wasn't much, uh, at least on the litigation at this point, uh, that we were able to do. And uh, so since September 5th, we've been very much engaged in trying to work on getting uh, legislation passed. Now, uh, there are a bunch of bills that have been introduced, the DREAM Act, uh, reintroduced by Senator Durbin and Senator Graham of South Carolina. There's a House Republican bill called the uh, Recognizing uh, America's Children's Act, the RAC Act. Uh, it's, mostly a Republican bill. Uh, uh, there's a Succeed Act, which is a bill that's been introduced in the, in the Senate, again, a Republican bill. 
Um, each of the bills has, and I'm not going to go through a lot of detail about them, they have a path to citizenship, et cetera, and, and, and other elements. And so uh, even the, the RAC Act and the Succeed Act, which is more conservative, are, are better than nothing, but they aren't really things that we have, would support and we haven't supported. Uh, they, they reflect, not surprisingly, the major differences among Republicans and Democrats, and even Interestingly, lots of differences uh, in the Republican caucus in the House and the Senate uh, about where they are on uh, trying to solve uh, the, uh, the question of what to do with the dreamers. The Dems uh, want a uh, fix uh, uh, to dock that as soon as possible. They've really set up an opportunity. Uh, there was this so-called uh, Chinese food agreement uh, between uh, the president and uh, uh, leader of uh, uh, Schumer and Pelosi at the White House uh, uh, to deal with. They were then dealing with uh, funding of the government, kicking it to December 5th, uh, but they also supposedly had some kind of agreement to, to deal with DACA. Uh, what that was and you know the details of it uh, and whether the president would, would stay with what he committed to, who knows. Uh, but the Democrats see December 5th as their best opportunity to try to deal with it. They have their most leverage because uh, the, the, the Republicans are going to need Democratic votes to pass uh, whatever way they are going to fund the government. They're going to need Democratic votes because there are a bunch of very conservative members of the House, uh, particularly those folks in the so-called Freedom Caucus, that will probably not vote for any, any uh, funding bill that gets uh, Put before them, and so the Democrats are going to have all this leverage, and they're really pointing to December as their opportunity to maximize that, and they're hopeful that they can solve the DACA issue uh, in early December. Republicans, they have a different view of it. They don't see December as, a, as the timetable at all. They see, oh, we have till March 5th, which is when the, the president announced uh, that DACA would be formally ending. Uh, uh, and, and they also want to see lots of other things uh, added to any effort to fix DACA. Um, the key issues really are going to be uh, sort of who gets covered. DACA has a, it's a narrower pool of, of, of young people than the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act is about 2.5 million people. DACA, as I said, there are about 800,000. Uh, is there, is there going to be a path to citizenship? Well, you know, and if there is, what's that path going to look like? Really, I mean, there are major differences about that. Uh, whether there would be money for increased enforcement and what would that look like? And then are there going to be broader changes to the immigration system like uh, something dealing with so-called chain migration, which is the far right uh, anti-immigrant uh, advocates and, and uh, Stephen Miller at the White House are pushing for. That's, that's a concern that they have, that, that if you allow dreamers to get a path to citizenship, what's against their citizenship, that they would then be able to bring in their family members in a chain uh, uh, so that their family members would have uh, access to a legal status in the United States. So uh, where are we? I see I have about two minutes left, so I'll try to wrap, wrap it up. And uh, I can talk about the travel ban maybe in the, in the questions and answers in the way in which higher ed which has really been a major sort of focus of the travel ban and, and the potential impact of, of what it would have uh, uh, on scholars and, and students. Uh, but, you know, we're going to see that the House has set up both uh, separate uh, uh, working groups. The, the, what, the fascinating part about uh, this so-called uh, agreement at the White House was that before that, there was discussion among uh, across party lines, and then as soon as that got announced and the, the Democrats said, oh, we have an agreement, the Republicans picked up their, their pieces and they went back into their corner. And so they've been working in these little uh, working groups. A couple of weeks ago, actually on the 8th uh, of October, the White House rolled out on a Sunday, very, uh, a group, uh, a set of very far right uh, principles on immigration, uh, uh, lots of folks, including many in the business community that we've been working with, um, uh, have uh, been referring to that as the Stephen Miller talking points. Uh, he's a far right staffer uh, in the White House. Um, I'll just close to say we've been higher ed, we've been sort of working very hard on trying to get the, uh, in addition to the sort of the substance I was talking about of where things are, we, this past week was what was labeled the higher ed uh, dream week. We, we organized and sent up to the Hill a letter of over 800 colleges and universities that signed on urging Congress to, to pass 
uh, a fix to this. We've been working very closely with uh, a number of uh, uh, larger coalitions uh, and groups, the tech community, the business community, surprisingly, the United We Dream, which is sort of the core uh, Dream Advocates, uh, ACLU, National Immigration Law Center, in, in any event. So that's sort of how I, I've been involved in it, uh, and uh, we can maybe talk about the Trump ban, trial ban, as we go along in that time. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Anisha. Uh, so I'm going to be talking. Um, but my work is primarily with LGBT immigrants, and um, my direct service work is with uh, detained individuals. Uh, most of our non-detained um, clients uh, have pro bono attorneys, so we're really lucky in Chicago to have um, uh, a really robust pro bono um, uh, kind of individuals. And the, a lot of the firms too are really um, are really helpful in making sure that we have uh, representation for individuals. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about detention. Uh, there's a lot changing, but um, I thought I would just give a few kind of statistics so that it kind of frames what we're talking about. Um, so uh, approximately uh, 380 to 442 individuals are detained a year. Um, and while there's the 30 the quota, a bed quota of 34,000, um, they're not always filled in the fiscal year of 2015. Um, the average daily detention or detainee population was 26,000. Um, but I don't, as of right now, it was down by 33, because the year before it was 33,000. So there was a little bit of a decrease in that. Um, and the amount of money that we spend as taxpayers on detention is quite interesting. It's $90 to detain a person in private prisons, um, while it's $72 to detain a person in municipal jail. And 60% of detainees are um, held in private prisons. So. Um, around 70% of current detainees are um, subject to mandatory detention. And mandatory detention um, has been around since, like, I think, the late 80s, but it kind of exploded with the two um, main uh, passages of the two acts. Uh, it's IRA IRA, which is the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act, and EDPA, I think is how people say, is Anti Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act which are both passed in 1996, and they categorized they, like, a huge number or a huge range of crimes as aggravated felonies. Um, and those, and a lot of those were for things like drug possession or theft, minor theft. Um, so the reason why I wanted to tell you about that is because um, LGBT immigrants are even more vulnerable than the average um, individual who's detained, and that's a lot to do with um, you know, biases around their sexual orientation and their gender identity, and also like the misgendering and the mis um, uh, detain detainment of individuals in the in a facility that's not you know safe for them or it's not with their the gender that they are that they um, are. And then, so another thing that I think is really interesting about detention is that there's the majority of people are detained in places that are kind of outside of. Um, like major cities, right? There, there's not really a hub of attorneys in a lot of these places. So um, nearly 85% of detained individuals go without representation. Um, and 80% of detainees are housed in under, unserved, underserved or unserved um, locations, which I, um, is also very interesting because uh, you know, the only 3% only of pro se asylum seekers uh, are granted per, uh, uh, granted protection compared to 18%, which is not very high, um, for those who have counsel. So, and one of the, the, case, the main concern for our project, um, and one thing that we've been working on, is just getting people out of detention, because it's unsafe. Um, their, the, their dignity is consistently and constantly challenged, and um, they're treated you know, inhumanely in a lot of ways. And a lot of asylum seekers, which is the primarily <coughs> who I work with, um, are coming from places where they've been harmed, they have maybe been arbitrarily like detained um, and tortured in those, in those situations, and then they're kind of coming for safety or refuge and then put it, be putting back into a process that kind of triggers them. Um, you know, the ways in which we've been able to do it and uh, get people out in the past, arriving asylum seekers, 
is through parole, which um, gives the authority to ICE or DHS to um, to release individuals who are, you know, that they pose like an urgent humanitarian concern and significant public benefit. Um, and in January 2017, uh, the memo was changed to, or the DHS changed um, kind of the requirements for, of parole and said that it should be used sparingly. But in there, they even they, they said that the kind of the the information or the the standard for individuals who are who have um, been shown to like uh, pass credible fear um, that that should remain in full force. But the way in which it's been interpreted, at least in the Chicago area, is that it's seldom it should not be used. While like people that we used to get out very easily, um, we are unable to get them out, or they're having to do their whole asylum case um, while they're detained. Um, so the ways in which we've been pushing back is. Um, we, I, it's constant nagging is a lot of things that I do, um, and, uh, you know, just trying to give as many, like, positive, um, you know, uh, attributes to, like, why this person should not be detained anymore. Um, but we have to be careful in that way, especially around our uh, transgender clients, because um, ICE has, the way in which ICE has, um, and ISIS Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, has kind of reacted or responded to our, you know, substantiated claims of sexual violence and physical violence is through hubbing, hubbing of transgender individuals. So in Santa Ana, in Santa Ana Jail in Southern California, for a long time there was a hub. It used to be that the um, it was cis gay men and trans women who were together in one um, pod. And then they separated them and they had two pods. Um, and then recently through a lot of community act, um, organizing and activism, um, Santa Ana did not renew their contract with ICE. So instead of just saying, okay, this didn't work, um, they decided to move the facility to a, um, a remote area in New Mexico called Cibola, which is a, a Cibola Detention Center, which is uh, privately owned and has, I think, over 800 beds in it. The pod is about 50 individuals can stay in the transgender uh, pod. As far as I know, they don't have like a cis gay men pod or bisexual man pod um, at the moment. Uh, but so in those, so in that area, now we're dealing with even a more difficult, um, you know, issue of how do we get these people represented um, when there's no. I think it's like an hour and a half from Albuquerque, and there's just no. Um, what do you call it? Uh, like legal services or even many attorneys that are around there. Um, but one you know positive thing that has happened and um, that we uh, that I wanted to share because I hate the things I hate just to be negative all the time because we do have victories and in, in, in you know what, even though we're in dire in a dire situation and I know I'm a young attorney so I can also um, gather that that's possibly just where I'm at right now but. Um, in uh, November, or sorry, in August of uh, 2017, um, there were 17 individuals, uh, 11 trans individuals, and um, six gay men who came uh, from Mexico and Central America, and they entered um, together. They were, you might have heard of it in the news, called, it was called the Trans Caravan. Um, and initially, I, you know, they processed them, and then they moved everybody to Zibola. Um, and then through a lot of advocacy with our partners at uh, Transgender Law Center and um, Instituto Viva, um, we were able to parole, get them all paroled out, um, which was a big feat, you know? It was, a, it, was, um, it was a lot of work, but we were able to do that, and it's, it's wonderful to you know, know that they'll be able to fight their cases outside of detention um, and with uh, you know, legal uh, representation. Um, and then, uh, you know, around bond, so some individuals are eligible for bond. Um, we have a, a wonderful organization in Chicago that's trying to um, end me uh, monetary bond called the Chicago Community Bond Fund. Um, and actually one of the founders is a Newsle grant. Um, but uh, anyways, they're starting to, while they're working towards uh, ending that monetary bond, and they're, you know, they're actually getting rather close, um, they also have, we're also starting to work on immigration uh, bonds and trying to make sure that we are raising the money for people to get out because a lot of times it's like $2,000, $5,000 and people can't pay it. 
Um, so that's another thing that we're working on and I think is really exciting and a, a good response to what's been going on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we need a hashtag. It's a NUSL thread. <laughs> um, so first of all, I just want to just take us, if you can indulge me in a moment, that this is my 20th. And um, also shout out to folks in 97. And also, um, there are friends who were in the school, not this room with me, um, here, who are just also on the front lines. And so I just want to like honor them um, as well. And um, you know, when I was in the Bronx, I'm a Bronx, New York girl, and when they said to go to Boston to like become a social justice lawyer, I was like, what? Like, can that be like in New York? But I'm glad that I that I did um, sort of suspend my New York skepticism. But I want to um, I want to start with kind of bringing it home first, because uh, the question that um, Professor um, Rachel asked is, you know, what's your response, and then what's your resistance? Um, and so I want to bring it home as um, a foreign born immigrant woman of color, as someone who was Muslim, um, as someone who grew up in a working class community in the Bronx, as someone who grew up with a mixed status, and for those of you who don't know what that means, is that in any sort of a family unit uh, building, there might be someone undocumented and all the alphabets that are, make our immigration law. And so that's the experience in which I sort of come to this work, uh, just generally. Uh, and I think it really hit me when my nine-year-old daughter said to me after Trump got elected is, uh, Amu, which means uh, mother in Bengali, is like, Amu, do we have to leave America? And I think, you know, it just sunk. I knew, like, excuse my language, shit was bad before, as we heard in the earlier panel. But I think that for the urgency for me, uh, just looking at her, and there's like a very sorrowful picture of her coloring all the red seeds in the map for her civics project for school, which I was like, ah, oh, does need it. So that's kind of where I come to in terms of the resistance, right? Um, so from that location of seeing the, the many ways uh, in which immigration and different laws have been actually impressive and not necessarily on the side of justice, and kind of doing that balancing act. And so what I want to lift up for today's talk is um, kind of a practice which is called community defense. And community defense is, um, just as a definition, is something that I want and encourage us to think about and to employ. It's uh, marginalized communities, communities of color have always employed this. This might seem, uh, sound familiar to you in terms of black Muslims and when they were so veiled, in terms of the black power movement of the 60s and 70s. Uh, side note, um, you know, being at Northeastern, you get a history lesson and you get legal theory, which everyone thought was useless, but actually is super helpful. Um, so don't, Dean, don't eliminate all of those electives <laughs> um, to get a job. Um, all of this come back. So what does community defense mean? So community defense is broadly defined, and it's still a definition and shift, is a set of practices that basically say that we will resist mass deportation, Islamophobia, uh, police brutality and all the systems of oppression that impact communities. And so um, the set of practices is a commitment and a pledge to do what's necessary to be able to uh, do no harm. And a lot of it comes out of actually the, um, the, the queer movement uh, in terms of the LGBTQ movement about harm reduction, right? Because when you experience state violence and then at the same time the law is not giving you any relief, you have to figure out ways to uh, reduce harm and then also mobilize. And so it comes out of that history as well. Uh, and also recognizing that um, we don't embody identities. I'm not a woman, I'm not just a raised body, I'm not a gender body, it's, it's interlocking expression, uh, oppression rather. So the community defense um, sort of framework kind of acknowledges that. So harm reduction, principle of justice, that we live intersectional lives and therefore our advocacy and sort of framework should be intersectional. Uh, so what does that mean? That sounds very meta. Um, how is that going to help me, Shantoni, to like resist? So um, I knew this is a Northeastern crowd. Uh, so I wanted to share with you three examples and I can maybe in the Q&A elaborate a little bit more um, of where this community defense approach has actually been successful. Well, first, already, I think DACA is a, a very good example of um, immigration sort of mainstream DC Beltway immigration community not delivering on immigration reform and undocumented youth 
putting themselves out there and creating this legal right. So and just like, let's not forget that DACA came about as a result of organizing. So I wanted to talk about sort of how um, different ways in which institutions by impacted community, led by impacted community, are demanding that they be protected from harm, demanding that they be sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, leaders in their own sort of struggle. And so three examples that I wanted to sort of lift up um, through uh, my work with community-based organizations um, is one uh, is this call for a hate-free zone, um, different neighborhoods that are densely immigrant and Muslim populated, and particularly they started with Queens, called the, uh, by a group called DRUM, which is a working class led South Asian organization. Um, those of them, and I'll explain to you what they, these campaigns are. And I'm going to sort of highlight what's the, you might say, I didn't come to law school to be an organizer. Um, I'm a lawyer in this part, so there's a role for you here. Um, Hand in Hand, which is an organization of domestic employers, they employer, uh, employ domestic workers, their Solidarity Homes campaign, campaign to give refuge to their immigrant uh, domestic workers who might be subject to raid and deportation. And then the third, and a shout out to a fellow classmate, Emma Lamey, around um, the push for sanctuary schools and uh, campuses. So these are three sort of campaigns and examples of how uh, communities have been demanding, uh, undocumented Muslim students, as well as communities of color, have been demanding from institutions to protect themselves, but not relying on the law, or relying on sort of the traditional institutions, but creating the infrastructure themselves. So the hate free zone, what they're doing is asking sort of neighbors and businesses to make a pledge. If you see a hate crime, be a good upstander. And literally kind of put it on your, uh, on your sort of uh, business window, neighbor to neighbor. How does it work? Um, when there was a kind of an, an stepping up of increase of, of raids in, uh, in immigrant dominant neighborhoods, and we were doing you know, your rights training, like don't open the door, show a warrant. Literally on the phone with folks inside their homes and telling them not to come out. Um, and then when the ICE sort of gave up, because they don't want to wait all along, is then moving them to another location to protect their safety. Because the first line of defense is that no one, everyone's here to stay, and we will not allow anyone to be deported, we will not let anyone to be registered. And so that's kind of the community defense model. And then there's, of course, more uh, affirmative, but I wanted to kind of lift this piece up because I think it oftentimes gets uh, sidelined. Um, solidarity home is the same thing. Domestic employers saying, I want to protect my immigrant worker, but then under immigration law, could you be subject to harboring? So giving the legal, strategic legal advice to folks who want to really go out there and put their body on the line and stop sort of this madness that's happening and do sort of the protection work. And then sanctuary is protecting our students. I hope Northeastern, I'm not sure, is a sanctuary uh, campus. Um, well, talk to me afterwards. Uh, let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. So, just what does that mean? It can't just be a name only, but how are you, for example, training faculty? And I'm, I teach in a CUNY system. If ICE comes in, security comes in, what do I do? What can I do? Will I be disciplined by my union if I actually stop ICE from taking one of my students? So, these are the kinds of legal questions that sort of we're tasked to ask in doing the community defense work. So uh, I can go on and on, but the, the legal work is that kind of strategic, that sort of innovative, kind of creative thinking that we are trained to do and to use that um, in the immigration context. Um, so I want to just like other two examples in the remaining two, two minutes is uh, specifically focus on Islamophobia. Um, you know, I think when Trump got elected, everyone was like, oh, you know, Muslim registry, we can't ever have it, have it happen in America. Well, it has happened. In 2003, uh, we had a special registration under immigration law of 26 countries from Muslim majority countries, uh, many of whom are people from Bangladesh was on that list, and that's where I was born. Uh, many of the people that I, I grew up with had to register, go to, I, go to immigration and register. So there we already had a Muslim registry, right? And because people have a faith in the system, about, um, about 30,000 folks were deported as a result of that special registration. So we learned from that history and so now when people were saying, well, we should, you know, stand, you know, white folks should stand in line and register. No, nobody should register. But <laughs> no. Like, I mean, it's just a violation of democratic principles. It's again, the community defense approach 
gives policies that oftentimes are ignored by some of us who are maybe not close to, and I think the dean talked about Brian Stevenson, if you're not in proximity to those who are most impacted, you're not going to come up with a solution. So Drum sort of did a head-on fight against the uh, special registration, had Obama dismantle it, and so when Trump came in on board, the only way that he can sort of do his Muslim ban was to do an executive order. Now, that's not where we want to land. But imagine if he had revived special registration, which is under the immigration law, which he would have the plenary power to do. So this is kind of slowing down the immigration system. Again, thinking strategically about how do we reduce harm, how do we protect communities that are vulnerable, and then do more of the affirmative. Because the litigation, successful 3.0, yay Hawaii, right? Um, but it takes time. People are deported in the meantime while we're doing our, our briefs. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, uh, and again, there's so many examples of community defense strategies or community defense approaches that have led to these victories. And so, you know, one of my call to is that for us to kind of do, put our resources towards that kind of work. So the last thing I want to mention is oftentimes when I was at Northeastern, um, human rights work and immigration work, domestic, global, were this kind of separation. You had to either do domestic work or global work, and you couldn't do both. Um, but actually, at this moment, I think we have a clear example of how we need to also take a global frame in our immigrant defense work. And so the two examples I want to just end with is before Trump, there was a mass hunger strike of a number of Muslim uh, detainees who were denied asylum, uh, who were denied uh, uh, parole because they were designated uh, terrorists uh, from Bangladesh. Well, they were designated terrorists as part of the global war on terror. So if you are going to be an immigration practitioner and you're going to think, well, how did this happen? Well, unless we understand sort of the, the geopolitics and the global war on terror, we're not going to see how it impacts and disadvantages diaspora communities here um, locally. Um, and the last thing is just because of uh, when you think about sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, interlocking uh, sort of oppressions, there's been a lot of effort through the sort of war on terror to protect LGBTQ asylees um, uh, in countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, because there's Muslim majority, therefore they're anti, they're homophobic, right? But using the war on terror rhetoric as a way uh, to reinforce Islamophobia and lift up um, LGBT rights isn't necessarily kind of the way to go. And so I think for us who are kind of innovative and thinking about interlocking oppressions is that we're not going to fight for one person's right if it's going to actually suppress someone else's right. So how do we craft a, uh, a platform that's really about dignity for all people um, to live self-determined lives? That doesn't mean that, um, and first of all, there are gay Muslims, so people do sit at the intersection of these identities. <laughs> Um, just an FYI. So I'm just going to end there. Um, but I guess the sort of takeaway is um, to not to ignore these community defense approaches and strategies. And there's really a, a, a really exciting a role for lawyers because it really forces you to have to think how does law function, what are the gaps, and what can we do about it. Thank you. So I, I did want to say thank you to Northeastern for having this panel and for including you know, me on it, especially for creating the, the uh, Immigration Law Clinic, um, which is many years uh, in the making. Um, it was actually during my time on the curriculum committee during my second year in law school that uh, we succeeded in convincing uh, the then dean to add immigration law and women in the law to the curriculum here. Um, so, that was my introduction to immigration law. Um, the need for lawyers and advocates to protect the rights of non-citizens um, in this country has never, in my view, been greater. Um, I do think there's an unprecedented attack uh, on the dignity of people um, who are seeking very basic protection. Uh, and I say unprecedented after having been an immigration judge for 20 years during uh, the period of time in which the immigration law itself was uh, rewritten to greatly expand, as we've heard, the types of crimes that are considered aggravated felonies. Uh, these could actually be misdemeanors, um, but in immigration parlance, they're aggravated felonies that strip people from their rights to be free from custody while their case is pending or to apply for relief. Um, 
and as well, greatly narrowing the types of relief that are available for people and the categories of people who could apply for them. That was all in 96, uh, implemented in 97. Um, and then there was the response to the September 11th attack, which was the uh, special registration program that uh, we just heard about as well. And interestingly enough, um, one of the countries that was greatly affected by that was Indonesia. Um, and there are very many people living in certain towns in New Hampshire, uh, working for certain uh, in certain industries that will just be devastated if people are forced to leave. And there was an argument yesterday in federal court over whether people should be given a second chance to seek uh, asylum because they're practicing Christianity. So, you know, nobody was aware before that special registration program, nobody in the administration anyway, that there was a lot of Indonesians who had been brought to this country to uh, perform, you know, very important skills, and if those people are in fact all removed, you know, these small towns in New Hampshire will be devastated. But what's unprecedented about, um, oh, and also I say it in light of the 2002 purge from the Board of Immigration Appeals of all of the liberal <laughs> uh, appellate uh, judges. So what's different now is that the barriers at the border are becoming much more egregious. Um, people are not being allowed to get to the United States to apply for asylum, which is their right. Um, so they're being turned away illegally. Um, they're being turned away illegally by being physically prevented from actually approaching a Customs and Border Patrol station, by being given a ticket that they have to come back at a certain time, on um, being forced to wait outside you know, in brutal heat without any water or food for days at a time. Um, they, the government has expanded greatly over the years, and this didn't start <laughs> just in uh, January, um, expanded detention of people and providing those or creating those detention centers at locations where not only are people isolated from their attorneys um, or, or from any hope of speaking to an attorney, but also isolated from their families who may already be re residing in the U.S. and able to provide for them. Um, the conditions to which they're being subjected uh, both at the border and then if they're successful in getting to one of these detention facilities are brutal. Um, we're talking, you know, women and children, um, vulnerable populations, many different kinds, not only LGBTQ, but just very young people, people with mental health conditions. And these are not detention centers that are set up with any particular training uh, to provide services for people who desperately need them. Um, there are restrictions. Uh, so there's barriers to obtaining attorneys, and there. this prior administration argued in federal court that three and four-year-olds could have their hearings without an attorney. Um, so uh, all of that existed under prior administration. What's changed is the vilification of people who are coming to this country to seek protection. Um, they are deemed criminals uh, when it is a civil uh, infraction to enter the country illegally the first time. These people aren't even entering the country illegally. They're, they're following the rights that they have to seek protection. There's also vilification of their <coughs> advocates and attorneys. Uh, the Attorney General, I think two weeks ago, I don't remember, it was two weeks ago, a week ago, <laughs> you know, referred to immigration attorneys as dirty lawyers who are milking the system, gaming the system. Um, now, there have been spectacular cases of attorneys running, you know, asylum fraud rings, but those are the very, very narrow exception. Um, and this concept of, you know, you're a dirty lawyer, I'm like all for that. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then the, the last sort of piece of it is this rewarding of people who use violence against people of color, uh, people who are Islamic. I mean, it is an outrage. Uh, what is happening. And the example, of course, is the pardon of Joe Arpaio. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're, that's new, I think. <laughs> um, the other piece of this is, you know, coming from my perspective as a former immigration judge, that there's actually an assault on the judicial process itself. Um, and the first piece of this is something that's kind of new happening, is restrictions or changing the the guidelines that asylum officers are given to review the cases initially. 
Um, they do an initial finding if somebody has a credible fear, and if they don't pass that, the individuals have a second bite at the apple. They can go to an immigration judge who reviews the case and says, well, the asylum officer was right. You know, you get sent back to your country. They say, well, you know, I think you might have a colorable case here. I'm going to vacate that decision. You have a right to get bond, be released into the community, and have a real, a full chance of, a, of providing your case. So there are some discussions within the administration of cutting out that second bite of the apple entirely. Um, and I can tell you, on average, I vacated about 50% of the cases that came before me. Um, not a high percentage, uh, but I tried. <laughs> um, and uh, the increased caseloads uh, for the immigration judge, they really have become untenable. And, you know, immigration judges are scheduled to be on the bench for seven hours a day. Um, they currently are required to agree to travel up to 44 weeks out of the year on very short notice. Um, they are required to travel on holidays and weekends. Um, they have to get special permission if they are told to travel on what's a religious holiday, but otherwise there's no exceptions to these rules. And they're being sent to locations right now where the internet isn't <laughs> available, so they can't do research. Um, you know, and there are various problems with the technology that's provided for them if the uh, hearings are held by video. Uh, the, the administration is now proposing numerical uh, uh, quotas for immigration judges as part of their performance review. Um, the Immigration Judges Union is uh, negotiating over how that might be implemented. Um, they have eliminated the training uh, for the immigration judges this year. I don't know if they're going to do one at all. Um, and uh, they uh, proposed, uh, they issued rather, a memorandum on uh, how immigration judges should not grant many continuances for attorneys to prepare cases um, and otherwise limiting immigration judges' uh, discretion to grant continuances in cases. Um, the Department of Homeland Security is under new uh, policy of not agreeing to bond amounts for people, uh, not waiving appeal if bonds is set for people, not stipulating to any form of relief for anybody, um, so that the work of the immigration judges in terms of de determining what's fair and rendering a thorough decision if there's a chance of it being appealing has just, uh, uh, it's being appealed is just magnified. Um, so the immigration judges, the American Bar Association, the American Immigration Lawyers Association are all supporting the concept of having an Article I court, which would bring the immigration judges out of the Department of Justice and have them be independent. So that's one movement that may or may not work in this current Congress. Um, but, the, but the response of organizations has really been amazing. I mean, there are groups at the border which help transport people through Mexico, um, provides uh, safe housing for them, other services that they may need, you know, escort them to the border so that they actually get to speak to a Customs and Border Patrol uh, officer and uh, apply. <coughs> there are organizations that help people who have been deported to Mexico and other countries to reintegrate and try to rebuild their life there. Um, the, there is a couple of organizations, the Dili Pro Bono Project and the Southeast Immigrant uh, <coughs> Freedom Initiative, Sci-Fi, which is my favorite name, uh, are organizing around various detention centers to provide uh, on-the-ground volunteer representation um, you know, through mentoring and training. Um, there is also a group that operates at Burke's uh, Family Detention uh, or Family Residential Center in uh, Pennsylvania where you have children and their mothers who have been detained for up to two years. Uh, and um, basically, I just want to say that, you know, I think the response has really been overwhelming. Another example uh, is New York, which, um, and this started uh, six years ago, I believe now, um, sorry, not that long ago, four years ago, I uh, started a, uh, both the city council granted money and uh, Appleseed Foundation granted money to provide representation to every single person who's detained in New York City, detained by immigration in their proceedings. Um, and that has, I think, expanded the statewide effort. Um, so, you know, there's a lot happening out there and uh, just tremendous 
a response to this, but I have to say it's a terrifying situation uh, for the for the people who are currently sitting on the bench, and when the judges are afraid, you know, God help us. <laughs> okay. Is it on? I don't know. Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, wow. It's uh, a little terrifying to go after this group of people. I'm really amazed by what all of you have said and done. Um, I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what it's like in the trenches. I'm your average Joe immigration lawyer doing this every day. Um, after the election, I'm, I mainly work with deportable immigrants. Um, I work at a small office, MSA and Church in Cambridge, and I work with people who are typically detained. I'm in detention centers several hours a week, um, usually several days a week, working with individuals who have either prior criminal convictions or um, prior deportation orders, or possibly both, um, and, and doing everything I can to find relief for them. So I was one of those girls that just did not see this coming. <laughs> I woke up the, the, I, you know, the night of the election was a real shock to me, and I woke up the next morning to flooded emails, flooded phone calls, people showing up in my office, not enough Kleenex in the world. The level of terror of the population that we serve was overwhelming. And my boss, Susan Church, was the head of the American Immigration Lawyers Association for New England. We call it AILA um, in New England. And we sat down and started talking about what can we do not just to help our clients, but to help the entire immigrant community here in New England. And we started reaching out to um, immigrants serving populations and groups and attorneys. And of course, people were already coalescing and they were already organizing. Um, Judge Klein is absolutely right that the organizations and the response from the immigrant serving communities have been just incredible. One example of that is uh, we decided after a number of meetings and phone calls that we wanted to have trainings for immigrants, the Know Your Rights trainings, but also to educate them about what local organizations were available and close to them if they needed immigration attorneys or other kinds of services and also what status they may have and how that status could potentially change under the Trump administration. And uh, Susan and I sent out a call to attorneys, to AILA attorneys in New England, saying, you know, would you be available to sign up to lead some of these trainings that are put on by CARE Project, which is the Political Asylum Immigrant Representation Project here in Boston. They created the whole format for the trainings, but they needed lawyers to lead them. And three hours after we sent out that email, we had more than 30 pages of volunteers. It was absolutely overwhelming. And that kind of level of support has not ceased. It's just been incredible how we can move forward. The group has stayed cohesive and strong. One of the things I did was um, kind of personally in response to this current crisis is I was one of the two attorneys in the airport the day after Trump signed the executive order, uh, the Muslim ban, banning entry from individuals from the seven Muslim majority countries coming into the United States. So on January 28th, I got a call from Susan, from my boss, saying, they're detaining people at Logan. I need you to come with me to the airport now. Um, we need to find some plaintiffs. We need to find a way to stop this executive order from taking effect, at least here in Boston. So I went to the airport with Susan, and we were able to identify two plaintiffs. They were Iranian professors, green card holders, who had been to a conference in Paris and were returning only to find themselves detained for hours by Customs and Border Protection. And we had kind of met them, not met them, because they were being detained, but through friends and family members and um, able to use them as our plaintiffs. And as soon as we had that agreement, we were on the phone with the ACLU, immigration attorneys, uh, Mince Levin, which is a big firm here in Boston, as many of you know, um, and then at the same time, trying to find a judge who would hear our case on a Saturday night calling everybody we knew. Susan was able to locate Judge Dean, who was a federal magistrate judge who was at the Schubert Theater at the time, <laughs> and talked and talked and talked until she finally convinced Judge Dean to have a hearing at 9.30 at night on a Saturday night. We raced from the airport to the federal courthouse. We met Carrie Doyle and Matt Siegel, who's the, um, the legal director at the ACLU, and a number of other attorneys, and argued well into the night. And we made a number of constitutional arguments, um, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment. But a lot of what we did was talk about what was happening on the ground, not just here in Boston, but all over the world that people were being taken off of planes because of this executive order and trapped in airports. And our proposed order actually included a directive to the airlines to let the people on the planes. And we won 
at 1.45 in the morning. And I think what made one of uh, our restraining order against this executive order one of the strongest ones is that it included that directive language. Um, and I spent the majority of the next week making sure that Customs and Border Protection and the airlines were actually following um, this order. And by the end of the week, there were people getting on the planes. And our restraining order was not continued, but um, just hours later, the order in Washington came down. And we had this amazing situation where people were already on planes coming to Boston. And that Friday and Saturday and Sunday at Logan Airport, I had the privilege of meeting the individuals I've been on the phone with all week. And Boston became a portal for people from these seven countries. So people were driving from Cincinnati and Kentucky and at all of these locations to meet people from the seven countries who are arriving by Boston. It was just an incredible privilege to be there and, and able to meet them and welcome them to the United States in the way in which they should have been welcomed in the first place. So that happened. And then I... <laughs> Uh, and then in the one cell phone, it's a lot of Hashtag. It's an NOSL grad. Uh, in the months after Susan and I got a lot of phone calls from people who wanted to go into federal court, immigration attorneys. They wanted to take habeas claims. They wanted to do that. But it's a difficult thing to do, in part because as immigration attorneys, we don't have a lot of um, federal court practice under our belts. A lot of us don't. Um, but also because it's very expensive, um, and often the client can't afford to take that kind of uh, monetary amount on, and it's, it's very time consuming. And um, we realized that these cases also were coming up more and more. What had, as, as many people have said, what had become more of a last resort is becoming kind of an only resort. And so we are finding ourselves in federal court with viable cases more and more. So Susan came up with this idea for the Federal Litigation Project, which is basically a program where attorneys who don't have experience in federal court can apply and they think they have a, a case where an immigrant could seek a habeas corpus petition or whatever it may be. Um, and they, they get into the program, they're given a stipend. Um, it's not a huge amount of money, but it's some money to help them with the cost of litigation. But they're also given a mentor attorney. So somebody who is an immigration attorney with experience in federal court who is able to help guide them through the process and the federal litigation system. And so that program, um, is a really neat part of, of what's come out of this as well. On top of that, just my day-to-day -day life um, in the world of immigrant representation, I have had a significant uptick in the number of people who are interested, um, who, who are desperate for, for treatment. I probably once a week get a phone call from a devastated mother who is standing outside a courthouse saying her son was just standing right next to her and immigration came and arrested him. They don't know where he is even. They don't know what's gonna to happen to him. And you know, you have to go through, okay, first of all, where is he? Which detention center is he in? Is he detained at Plymouth? Is he at South Bay? Second of all, why is he there? Is it a criminal conviction? Is it an old deportation order? And third of all, what kinds of relief are available to him? And if he is in one of these categories where he could be deported very quickly, you have to move quickly. And it's, it's uh, um, a very difficult thing for an immigration attorney to do, and it's a terrifying and, hor and, and horrible thing for the family and for the immigrants themselves to go through. Um, I have also continued to be working with this larger community of incredible immigrant serving for, you know, organizations. We've been on phone calls at meetings with the nonprofit, the AG's office, um, and other lawyers in response to basically every major measure, the rescission of DACA, the sanctuary city raise, um, and on top of that, I'm on a uh, national airport committee that's creating a coordinated response for each change in policy that may affect immigrant arrival. So what have I learned and, and what are we going into this with? I think I've learned that you can't be afraid to act. You have to step in. Um, if you see something that is an unconstitutional act that's taking place, I think we need to do something to react and respond. Even though it's a very scary thing to do, you have to just walk into that fear. Um, but you can't react without thinking. You have to get as much facts as possible um, from the client, from the family members, from everyone around you in the situation. You need to meet with amazing immigration lawyers and um, go on listservs and Facebook pages and see, is this an isolated incident of a constitutional abuse or is this something that is happening on a larger scale? Um, and uh, you have to consider your personal safety. Um, I am guessing I'm not the only person on this panel 
that it has received hate messages and hate mail and um, been targeted for some reason because this is a very highly volatile time and we're working with a um, very vulnerable population. So I think I've learned that Trump can do a lot to harm immigrants um, in a very short period of time with the DACA rescission, with a lot of the um, stepped up enforcement, um, but that we can also win in the courts. Um, the travel ban's been stopped in its tracks three times now. Um, and again, we also have a population of Americans who are rising up and mobilizing in support of immigrants. But most importantly, I think, is this group and these organizations that have come together. And I think that the partnerships that we're making with these people, with the common goal of resisting any form of human rights violation against this vulnerable population, I think those connections are going to serve us now and into the future. much to all of you. I think we're just going to open it right up immediately to the audience just because I, I have a feeling that you probably have a lot to say here. Uh, yes? So what you're doing is absolutely incredible and incredibly encouraging, but I feel like the only reason that Trump is able to do this stuff and other folks are able to put this in place is because they're tapping into this toxic <coughs> reservoir that we have in our country of distrust, dislike, fear of immigrants of, of all kinds, but particularly Muslims. Um, and, I, and I think just as we've seen in other campaigns, there needs to be a component that's, that's kind of the information uh, piece of it too. My sister lives in Canada now. Communities can sponsor immigrants. They've got you know, a Syrian family in their little tiny town in Nova Scotia that the community is sponsoring to bring there. And I have partners in my firm in New Hampshire who think, oh, well, a ban on Syrian immigrants sounds like a good idea to me. And it just blows me away. Um, what What is needed, what can we do, in addition to the legal work as attorneys, I feel like there's a, also this public information component that's, that is really needed at this time. That's a big question. I'll try to respond to that. I agree. <laughs> um, and I've worked a lot with the media through this, um, these many kind of months of this. And I think part of the difficulty and the frustration that we have is that there's only a certain kind of story they want to bring. And it's this one individual's life and how this one individual and his family may or may not have been affected by this. Or how there is a raid in this one particular population. Or, you know, when the Supreme Court came down and changed some of the restrictions for the Muslim ban, it got taken in a completely different direction than, than we had all anticipated. It wasn't as big of a of a backlash against the immigration community, as people like to say. So part of the problem is that um, we can get out there and we can start talking, but if we're not the ones delivering the message, it can be, it can be difficult. And the general education, like what we're doing in the Know Your Rights trainings and all of these things, we're trying to get it out to the immigrants themselves, but individuals, I think you're right, that immigration, immigrant-serving communities and people that are interested in these issues, there needs to be more um, general education of people in those communities. Yes, I do some questions. Well, Trump's election was all, I believe, about hate, the culture of hate in this country. <clears throat> but he touched parts of people with the new, what you call, quote unquote, the new immigrant population as opposed to the people that came in the 20s and 30s is the separation. The people that came in the 20s and 30s had to assimilate. They had to learn English. There was, or you didn't get a job. Or you had to be legal, or I guess somehow become legal. Unfortunately, the United States has now become almost like not warlords, but separate sections. People are not assimilating. We're not announcing power. And he managed to get into this the separation, you know, and say they don't pay taxes, they don't do this, they don't do that, uh, they're, you know, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, because everyone is always afraid of people and things they don't know. And until there's, I think, a little more assimilation, you're going to have people supporting him. There's no other no, reason I, I think he was elected. I, I really don't agree with you. I don't agree with you 
first, uh, you know, I'm a descendant of Irish immigrants who actually said, make room. You know, they didn't assimilate. They created their own world. They already spoke English. But, you know, I'd like to, to say, I think the fundamental problem is with the economy. And people are angry about their inability to see their kids have a stable future, to you know have a secure retirement where they're not going to lose their home if they have to go to a, a hospital. And there is a, a ongoing, very deeply embedded effort uh, from people who control the media to say, this is about the immigrants. When it's not, it's about the greedy, <laughs> six families who control pretty much every aspect of uh, you know, uh, production and have control over everything in this country. Well, then and and the problem, yeah, it, it's not about assimilation. It's about educating people about what's really going on. And if they're not going to listen to you, you can't do it. But the message that has got now has been the message of the, of the non-assimilating. If it's about the economy. But it's not about them not assimilating. It's about changing the message. But you don't you need have, more assimilation. But, you need but more messages. you have to work to change the message. Right. To yeah. show the true well, message. Well, the just, just to respond, I think the judge sort of mentioned it, is that um, this is where um, history and legal history, again, back to like, you know, I think as activists, sometimes we poo poo like anything that's like an intellectual or this is. The only time you put your record is a big up to scholars and uh, <laughs> is that it's actually not true. It's it's I mean I'm not just I mean there was Jewish ghettos. I mean when there were Eastern European immigrants in the 20s and 30s, anarchist socialists who were deported, right? Uh, oftentimes because they didn't assimilate because of their sort of identity. Um, so, so I think that, I think we just have to, um, I think to your point, I do agree that we have to get that message out. And so the community defense approach, that's why I feel like is an approach that really looks at history, right? So for example, the registry that I mentioned, people were like, oh, we can never have a, um, and the reason why I actually don't use the word unprecedented is because we have continually used the legal system as a form of exclusion. So it's happened before. And then the, the economy, um, just as someone who works on the intersection of sort of immigrant, immigration and labor, um, you know, since the 90s, we've sort of um, promoted a policy of outsourcing and deregulation and neoliberalism, which has caused jobs to sort of go abroad and create lower paying jobs, right? That, so I think back to the global and sort of understanding this, this sort of uh, kind of where is this anxiety coming from? And the other thing is, let's be real. Um, you know, uh, 2015, uh, people of color are going to be the majority, and there is white anxiety. So I think that if we're not gonna sort of address white supremacy as an integral part of what's happening right now, right? Um, I think earlier, 53% um, of white women voted for Trump. Like, you can call him the pussy crap, whatever you want, I, don't, I still don't understand how that, like, where, where, where is that about, right? So I think we just, I just want us to really do the hard conversation of one, this correcting historical misinformation about assimilation. Okay. It's about who is allowed legally to assimilate. Okay. Because okay. under a naturalization law, let me just give you some factors. The professor can tell you, right? Is that people of color are not allowed to be citizens. Period. They couldn't assimilate. They were not legally allowed to up until 1965. So anyway, I don't want to get this into a dialogue, but correct misinformation, get the message out there, which I agree with, and also understand the ways in which systems like the economy have structured what we're seeing today um, to understand what's happening. It's not just, oh, we haven't really addressed the white working class, right? I grew up in the Bronx, which is a predominantly Italian, Irish, Puerto Rican and Asian neighborhood. So, like, it's not necessarily, it's about sort of also the sort of elephant in the room, which is the, uh, talking about white supremacy. So I wanted to, no, I, just wait, I, just want, I want to make sure, we, we've got only a couple minutes left, I want to make sure we get a few other questions in here. Uh, Ragini. Yeah, so thank you, this has been a great panel. I really want to thank everybody for their comments. Um, and I was curious, actually going back to something that Stephen said at the very beginning about 
when we were scribing a lot of bills that are in commerce right now, and some of them are kind of better than nothing, but they're not ideal. And I've been wondering about this kind of continuum on which, and I'm curious what other people think too about throwing your head in the rain to be for something that's better than nothing versus really trying to dig in for the long haul fight to be actually just. And I guess I'm wondering about if anybody wants to address that, your thoughts about that. Because I think one of the things that this atmosphere has done is created a lot of fear amongst people who have privilege, you know, who feel who could be potentially be more than, than we are. And I think that um, yeah, so I, I just feel like there's there's maybe a tendency to go for better than nothing because we feel like that's what we can get. And that was actually true under previous administrations as well. But I think it's even more of a danger now, and so I'm curious about what your thoughts are about that. Well I would say uh the various bills that I described as better than nothing, we're certainly not endorsing them. We certainly don't <laughs> want those bills to pass. I think the strategy of some of our uh, coalition partners, like the tech community, has a, a major push. It's kind of astonishing the degree to which business community, even the Chamber of Commerce, okay, the, the Chamber of Commerce that supports lots of things we probably wouldn't support, uh, is pushing hard for a fix. And uh, a lot of the tech community is pushing some of these bills, not because they believe they're the right solution, they want to get Republicans on record supporting a path to citizenship. That itself is uh, an important step because that has to be part of whatever the legislative solution is, a path to citizenship. So, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, a lot of these bills are awful. They're, there's one of the bills, uh, has a provision in it that requires uh, uh, folks who would go on this path to citizenship to get a medical exam uh, as part of their uh, final stages. And we've been referring to that as the Ellis Island provision. Uh, and, you know, it's an abomination. Uh, um, but I, I think it's, you know, uh, Washington and the legislative process is, is uh, people often describe it as, you know, the sausage thing, and that's true. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, you sort of think strategically. We're not going to be pushing bills ultimately that we don't want to see enacted, but I think the, the goal is to try and get position it so that you get at the end of the day when a deal is cut, and there will be a deal, and there may be some things in the deal that we're not going to like, but uh, we don't control the government. Democrats don't control the government. Uh, and so they have to be, unfortunately, they have to be, there's got to be a bit of pragmatism there. So. Okay, I, we have time for one more very quick question. I yes. just, uh, I just uh, wanted to thank you all for your very valuable work. And um, Chantoli, I couldn't agree with you more about historical knowledge, um, Judge Klein, about uh, the economic basis of all of this. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, as, as part of that uh, uh, question earlier about the PR and media piece of this, I feel too that in, this is a truth that has been through the ages and even currently happening now in various parts of the world, that the minute that you uh, place a label on a group of people, um, and in this case illegal, um, you know, we see it with the Rohingyas, we saw it with the Nazis, you can do anything you want to that group of people because you've separated them out from the general population. And it's, the, uh, it's that naming you know, that label of illegal that is allowing all of this other stuff to happen. The legislation which is so far, you know, the, the news articles that are, how are we treating them? Um, because they've become something that's a little less than the rest of us, right? And I just think that that is a media um, PR issue that folks are just not addressing. There's a great campaign called Drop the I Word, I'll just say, um, uh, that w has been quite successful in, um, in changing the way the media uses that term. It you know, doesn't do anything necessary for the people who keep hurling it around, but the, you know, for how it gets reported. Um, does, uh, does anyone want to take on that question? Well, I can just say just um, part of the reason why last year I started uh, this new project about the margins is precisely that um, is law and media not profiting to sort of make those strategic sort of interventions around the narrative because you know the narrative determines like policy and it determines a lot. You know, storytelling, you know, I, I don't think I really registered as a student how much crafting the story, who tells the story, um, has power. 
and so uh, how much that isn't important. So PR and messaging, um, and so to me, I talk about not in terms of you know uh, PR and this sort of. Some people have this reverse reaction to it, but just storytelling and narrative and lifting up those stories. So a lot of the community groups have made, uh, and even around the sanctuary uh, issue that the community system made it as a principle of organizing not to engage in good Muslim, bad Muslim, deserving immigrant, undeserving immigrant, criminal, legal aliens, or non-criminal. Whatever your personal view of who is deserving, at this particular political moment, um, they were sort of trying to get to a consensus that we would not engage in that storytelling. So for example, um, in the beginning, I think uh, it's been pretty successful. There was like a little bit of like, um, no, DACA, oh, the dreamers are more impacted than everybody else. You know, here's this hardworking student, you know, not the sort of maybe this, you know, the, the young person who had a um, you know, criminal record. Think about um, New York City is a sanctuary city, but we also have broken windows, which means that it disproportionately impacts black immigrants, immigrants of color, that have a criminal record that makes them deportable. Right? So like not engaging in that narrative and also seeing sanctuary not as an immigration issue, but that's also a racial justice issue. So in our CUNY's sanctuary platform, we made those principles very clear. That it's so, I think so much, and it's really hard because there is that temptation, right? As I think as Rodney sort of alluded to, to just be like, you know, I'm not gonna do that. But I think that's where we're now seeing the harm. But we now have evidence of the harm thing. And we have evidence that, that does not has not worked for us, you know, creating this othering. And so therefore, I think that's the lesson learned to not to do that and craft stories that also are really about how the community is impacted. So I think I agree. So I just to say, yes, and that's happening, and people are thinking about that on the ground. Um, and that's why to me, community defense approaches are really where you see people as human, as as you know, people having interlocking identities. And so that's um, if there's journalists here, um, if we work with freelance journalists to like lift up stories. Um, don't necessarily rely on mainstream press, blogging, uh, you know, use whatever media, democracy, media is democratic now, so we use those mediums as a way to get your, your message out. Um, I just want to end, Nina Simone is one of my like badass sort of just jazz, and she has a quote that's like my mantra post-Trump is if love's not being served at the table, get off the table. And so my whole thing is like, if that immigration bills are just going to secure tourism or border, it's going to create what the judge is mentioning. It's going to create harm in the community because we're only looking at in silos of immigration status. That's not worth fighting for. And I think that's really where, where most of the community groups that are impacted are. They're not going to support any legislation that's going to uh, and militarize the border in exchange for any pathway. They'd rather be undocumented. That's that's the conversation we're we're having. Thank you so much. So I want to add my thanks yeah, to Rachel no. and the panel. Uh, lunch is downstairs, two floors. Uh, those of you who are going on the duck tour, uh, or the, the, there's a Fenway Park tour. I wish we were playing the Yankees instead, but, uh, and, and, and then tonight, uh, 6.30 uh, is drinks uh, at the Conway Hub Lab. We have Ray Pinato will be the future.